Hi everybody, my name is L.B. Sperling. I am a transgender lesbian atheist who illustrates holy scriptures in Lego bricks. Um, that's what I do. And uh, my current project is the Brick Book of Mormon. If you haven't seen that, you should check it out. Uh, that one's just online at this point. It's brickbookofmormon.com. But I'm most well known uh, for having spent 10 years illustrating the Old Testament and New Testament everything from Genesis to the book of Revelation. And if you haven't seen the book of Revelation in Lego, you're missing out. Um, so come by the uh, author's uh, panel over, or the author's section over here if you want to flip through some of my books and check out what I do. And, um, and my and everyone's books are for sale over at the uh, booth on the sidewalk. And now David Fitzgerald. Thanks, Elby. Yeah, my name is David Fitzgerald, and I've been happy to come here at Free Thought Day for many years now. And uh, thankful to Dave Diskin for putting it all on. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm probably the most famous in that I'm famous at all for a book I wrote in 2010 called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. No hyperbole. I'm not joking. I really don't even think there was a guy named that. Uh, who was that? Um, since then, I've come out with a, a series called The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion. The first book was The Mormons, and the latest three books in that series were actually all follow-up books to Nailed. It's called Jesus Mything in Action, and it takes on, rather than Nailed, which took on the top ten ways that Christian's official story just fails when it comes to Jesus, Mything in Action takes on the arguments I get from atheists trying to tell me that, oh yeah, I know he wasn't the son of God, but there really was a Jesus. There really, really was not a Jesus at all. And I have three books to talk about that. And they're all available on the table, and you can pick them up at front. And now here's Candace Gorham. I got my own. I'm special. I got my own microphone. So my name is Candace Gorham. Um, I'm the author of the Ebony Exodus Project, Why Some Black Women Walk Out on re Religion and Others other Should, too. Um, so I am here for the first time, this is my first time in Sacramento, all the way from North Carolina. Um, so, yep, I'm glad, I'm excited, having a good time, and um, yeah, I'm excited. I don't know, I don't have anything else excited to say. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Evan Davids. I recently uh, released a book titled Christianity No Longer Makes Sense, so I'll briefly uh, tell you what that's about. Um, as the title suggests, in my opinion, um, Christianity hasn't aged well. Things that used to make sense, or at least a little bit of sense, uh, no longer do. Uh, for example, uh, there's a central Christian belief that humans are fallen, right? Adam and Eve's disobedience brought sin and death into the world, and every single person is now contaminated with a sinful nature and in desperate need of a savior. So what happens if there is no Adam and Eve? What happens if there is no fall? What happens if we're not descended from a specially created first couple, but from a long line of wild animals, right? We have two very different stories. Um, so obviously evolution is, is not new, but what is new, I think, is the, the conversation that's happening within evangelical Christianity right now. And that there's a debate. Um, previously, they, they hold their theology together by rejecting evolution, but increasingly, um, there's calls from apologists and theologians to, to make peace with evolution, incorporate it into the theology. So anyway, in my book, I look at ways that they're trying to smush these two worldviews together. And um, I also look at uh, hell, that the lovely Christian idea that non-believers will be kept alive forever in utter misery. And that, for some reason, pastors don't like to talk about that as much anymore. So I try to shine a light on that, um, just show how it, there's not... People don't know what to do with it right now, okay? And it's not easy to just get rid of doctrines. And um, I look at uh, Yahweh's behavior in the Bible. So, so some fairly low-hanging fruit, but it's um, big, juicy, important fruit. So and that's why I wrote it, right? It's, it's basic stuff, but it has major implications for Christian theology. All right, I'll say a few things about myself, but I also uh, want to point out we're going to open it up to questions after I'm done, so... Brainstorm, be, have questions ready, uh, and then uh, after I'm done, uh, we'll, we'll go to audience questions. So my name is Thomas Smith. I'm, unlike uh, the other panelists, I'm not smart enough to have written a book, uh, but, <laughs> but I, do, uh, I do podcasting, and I got into it 
because I had never read the Bible and I had some recording equipment lying around. And on a whim, I just decided, you know, I'm just going to go through the Bible as an atheist. It's just a guy. And just read it now and see what it says and, uh, and, and how it fares. And I discovered some really interesting things upon doing that. For example, that things that I'm sure you all know that I didn't know because I hadn't read it. For example, every story that anyone knows from the Old Testament is pretty much the first two and a half pages of the Old Testament. There's, what about Adam and Eve? Yeah, that's paragraph like one and two. Uh, oh, what about uh, Noah? There's all that story, right? Yeah, that's a couple sentences later, uh, and that's done. And uh, it turns out there's like, you know, 400 more pages after that of the boringest, <laughs> most backward, contradictory content ever. But uh, I got through it, and I wanted to no longer be limited to the Bible, so I started another podcast to talk about more general atheist stuff. And fast forward, I suppose, to cut a, a long story short, now I, I host Serious Inquiries Only, uh, where I've, I've focused a little less on atheism because, in my opinion, there's another religion that I think is doing more harm than we realize to separation of church and state, uh, and that is anti-progressivism, and that is anti-feminism, and anti-political correctness. It's something that I think people are being very short-sighted if they're not noticing how much that attitude splits the left and then allows the religious right to come in and do things like steal a Supreme Court justice nomination uh, and put like a 15-year-old guy in there who's going to be ruining our lives for the next 70 years, uh, Neil Gorsuch. So there's things like that that I think we are really not keeping our eye on the ball if we are not noticing how much better Democrats are at protecting separation of church and state, at keeping religious beliefs out of women's health out of, our, out of our lives. The left is better at doing that. They're not perfect, they're better at doing that. And when we forget that, when we allow the right to take power by getting distracted over horror stories, over what some feminist somewhere said one time on the internet, we are losing sight of what's really going on. And what's really going on is the right, the, the Republicans are controlling every level of government right now and they are setting us back. So that's been my focus, but I'll get off my soapbox right now and say, uh, uh, let's, let's open it up to audience questions. Uh, what do you say? I hope you've had time to brainstorm. Uh, yeah, here, I'll just, does that work? I'll just go, I'll just go hang out with you guys. Why not? Oh, oh well, maybe the speakers will. Oh, you got it. Okay. I didn't want to hang out with you anyway. Two, three. It's working. Okay. <laughs> First, thanks to the authors and podcasters for being here today. Um, I really had two questions. One is kind of a repeat from last year. Uh, one is, uh, could you tell me when you first realized you were an atheist or a non-believer? What's the story behind that? And my second question would be, as all published authors, do you find that there are certain publishers that are more receptive to atheist or non-believing works in your experience? Thank you. Uh, I'll start. Um, I was uh, a church-going child. Uh, my mom was a Sunday school teacher in the Episcopalian church, and I attended uh, church till I was about 12 or 13 years old, and it was right around then that um, I went through this, uh, just of my own accord, went through this sort of skeptical phase. Uh, there wasn't really um, an internet around for me to connect with other atheists or skeptics, and uh, everyone else in my family and, and my friends uh, kept on believing. But um, for some reason, I went through a skeptical uh, period and tried to kind of put away the magical thinking I had noticed uh, in my childhood, even though I didn't know the term for it at the time. And um, I, I turned that skepticism toward religion and uh, particularly the efficacy of, of prayer. It just seemed like whether or not I prayed for something had, or anybody prayed for anything, had uh, no bearing over the outcome of what they prayed for. Um, so uh, I was, um, I was, a, I was a precocious kid. I was 13 when I became an atheist. And um, as to your second question, um, I haven't worked with that many uh, publishers, but um, but mine is uh, a sort of medium-sized publisher in New York City named Skyhorse, and. Uh, they've been very open to working with uh, authors from all sorts of backgrounds, so I applaud them for that, and I'll pass the mic on. If it's cool with you, how about we do the deconversion stories first and then do the publishing stories all together? Um, mine's kind of a funny story. I was raised super Southern Baptist, the one true faith, so 
uh, I really believed it all well into college. And um, I used to flirt with this girl by having theological arguments with her. So one day, we're going back and forth the way we did. And she goes, well, Dave, you know the Hindu religion is like 3,000 years older than Christianity. And I was all set to jump down her case and assure her that it wasn't. And I stopped, and I had to think for a minute because I had no idea if Hinduism was older than Christianity or not. And once I, that bolt from the blue hit me that I was about to say something with great passion and enthusiasm that I didn't know was true or not, all of a sudden, well, how many of you know the talking heads? The, the, the one song, um, Once in a Lifetime, where he says, am I right or am I wrong? My God, what have I done? It was like there was a little David Byrne on my shoulder saying this. And I realized I'm just like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm just repeating what I was told. And it wasn't a gradual departure from Christianity. It's like up to that millisecond, I was a firm, died in the wool creationist uh, Christian. That moment, Christianity looked and felt fake from then on. It's like I lost my virginity and couldn't go back. So. Um, is it okay if I just. Uh, early 1920s or so. The virginity question or the. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is it okay if we sit? Do we have to all keep standing? Well, they, they want us to stand. Oh, we have to keep standing? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, I really, I really hate that question. Like, that question comes up every, of course, like, you can't avoid that question, right? But it's such a long story. So, so the quick version, right? So I've done some of everything, right? So I did, you know, Joe, like, from a little kid, we did, like, Jehovah's Witness, and then, you know, then I did, um, you know, United Methodist because that's what, like, my dad's family of origin was. And then, um, you know, and then I kind of got into the more extreme stuff, which is where I got into more of the talking in tongues and the shouting and casting out demons. And, you know, I mean, we were, like, really, really seriously, like, into it, right? Um, and then I ended up um, moving away to another country. I moved to Bermuda. And left, you know, left behind is just me, my husband, my child, didn't have a church, didn't have a church home, didn't have, you know, that sort of network around me. And I had already for a couple of years sort of started doing that little gradual shift process, right, where you go from, you know, yeah, mm hmm I believe this thing, to, you know, to a more like, you know, Jesus is the way. You know, and then you go more to like a, you know, he's a, he's a good prophet. He's somebody that you should believe in, right? Then you do the more like, you know, well, you know, it's one of the ways. You know, and then you do more of the, I believe in something. <laughs> you know, there's something out there, right? And then you do the whole like, you know, well, like you guys don't know the answer. You can't say he is and you can't say he ain't. So why are we arguing about this thing? Like, I don't know. So I'm going to just stay right here on agnostic because I don't know. Right? And then one day it became, you know what? I, you don't, I, I'm not living like it's anything there and ain't nothing talking to me and I'm not talking to it. So I just might as well go on about my merry little way. And that's basically how that happened. That's basically how that happened. And that was my mid, mid to late 20s or so. Late 20s, something like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, first question, I, I think I'm going to alienate myself real quick here. Um, I'm not sure I'm an atheist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, I always operated as a theist, but was never a Christian, so I couldn't, never took on that title, but sort of still operated as if theism were real, but... Um, I think now I'm kind of I kind of like deism still. That's still a potential, and uh, uh, somewhere somewhere in between. I don't know and deism maybe. Um, I don't know what I want to be called yet. So there we go. So that's where you are on Candace's scale. Yeah. Well, I I wouldn't mind answering for a quick sec if you don't mind. I mean, I'm not an author, so I'll just do the first part. Um, yeah, I'll keep it quick because I, I can't, no one can beat Candace's answer. That was exquisite. Uh, <laughs> but I, um, I did the thing that I think a lot of people do, which is I, I was raised very marginally Christian, just kind of casual, had to go to church to make my mom happy uh, until high school, and then I was allowed to not go. And I didn't go because it was 
so boring. I mean, that was the main thing. I remember one time I took a friend to church because he was, you know, hanging out Saturday night, so Sunday morning, mom says, okay, you got to go to church. And he must not have been religious, um, but it was just normal to me. You go to church, you do whatever. And I have this, this vivid memory, I don't know, I must have been 10, of sitting in the pews, the, the normal boring sermon by a thousand-year-old man that I, don't, I can't remember, relate to at all. And I remember seeing my friend, sit, his tiny little body, you know, because his 10-year-old body in the pew, sitting with his head against the next pew, just <laughs> the, the physical boredom, the, the hurt. It was, I've never seen someone so in pain of boredom. It was, I'll never forget, he was just like, Ugh, just, I, it's so bored. Uh, and I, I'll always remember that. But, but I, I, for a while, I would try to make a version of God that would make sense to me. And I think we all do that. I think, I think the evidence shows that God hates all the people that you hate and it's cool with all the people you're cool with, which is most, almost nobody. Um, but <laughs> so I did that for a while until I, like, I had this picture of, of what I thought it was. And at a certain point, I realized I just wanted that to be true. Like I, unlike some, some atheists, like I really wanted there to be a God. I want there to be a place where after we die, we go, it all makes sense. Everything we didn't know, they're just like, yeah, no, we have an answer to that. Here, come this way. We'll tell you the answer to that. And it'll all be laid out. Uh, but, but eventually I realized, like, we just don't live in that world. Like, there's so much. Pa- Watch one episode of Vice News and tell me there's a God. Like, just one, ep- half an episode. There's two segments per episode usually. Watch one segment. And it'll be about how some people are just dying somewhere that you've never heard of. They have no food. They have disease. And, and I, to, to think that a, a perfect, kind God would allow this is, is just, has always been ludicrous to me. Uh, and so that's the main, the main reason I'm an atheist. But now to the smart people, publishers. <laughs> oh, uh, so I have not much experience here. I didn't, I didn't try to shop around, but there is a, there is a, a publisher that's very open to anything. It's uh, Amazon self-publishing. <laughs> so uh, create space. It's nice and easy. Um, my publisher is Pitchstone Publishing, and it's specifically for um, atheistic, agnostic, non-religious. Like, you specifically have to be that in order to publish. So, no problems there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love Pitchstone. Pitchstone is my audiobook publisher, um, which was formerly through uh, Secular Media Group, through it, Dave Smalley. There's my man. Shout out to Dave. Um, though, um, Pitchstone, Prometheus Press... Um, are all good presses from an atheist standpoint, but just from a, a strictly small author business standpoint, it made more sense to go with Amazon Create Space because um, as an author, you want this, 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 this from your publisher. You want them to do distribution, you want them to do promotion, and the more that you realize that you are going to be on the hook to do, the more it makes sense for, well, if I'm going to have to do all of it, I might as well just keep all the money and go through uh, Create Space. And it, there's never been a better time for uh, self-published books now. The sad news about that is there's never been a better time for self-published books now. And n- not all self-published books are created equal. And you. Oh, oh, that's right. I'll be answered. It. Do we have another uh, listener question? Where's? I was I was told not to go into the audience. Oh, okay. Uh, this is for LB. Uh, can you? Name maybe one or two things that you didn't know about Mormonism that you learned through your artistic work? Uh, Sure. Um, Yeah. Um, Unlike uh, Christianity, I had studied ancient Christianity and Judaism in college, so I came to the Brick Bible Project knowing a lot about it. Um, When I wanted to start the Mormon Project, it required a fair amount of research, so I spent uh, six months just intensively reading everything I could get my hands on, all the teaching manuals and guides of, of which there are just, there are just uh, hundreds on the uh, LDS website. Um, and so uh, as to a couple things that I didn't know, one of the ones that surprised me the most was that, um, um, well, they, uh, so people have mischaracterized the Mormon religion as saying, like, everyone gets a planet of their own. And, and um, I think there's a, there's a quote about that in the, um, in the uh, Book of Mormon play that's so popular. But, uh, it's, and, and it's so popular that the LDS website has a special page that explains, no, that's wrong. We don't actually get a planet when we die. And, but they don't go on to tell you the 
the actual truth behind their teaching, which is made plain in, in many of their teachings. It's not like they can really deny this. Um, it's that, yes, humans can be, uh, humans just like you and me can, uh, uh, through, you know, through living correctly, become gods, and gods can give birth to billions of spirit children of their own who will inhabit you know, millions of Earths. So it's not just everybody gets their own planet, it's more that everybody gets their own, say, universe. Uh, the other one that uh, I, I, I was very surprised by is um, that there, um, the Mormons believe that the God, uh, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ. So if you look at their actual like illustrated um, children's Bible, and when they have uh, Moses on the mountain meeting God, he's meeting Jesus. And, and uh, it's pretty wild that you have Jesus making all these appearances throughout the Old Testament. And it's, it's fascinating to me because uh, the Mormon religion takes a lot of, there are a lot of things that if you just look at Christianity and just read the Bible, you kind of scratch your head and you wonder, well, that doesn't make so much sense. Or, you know, why did Jesus just show up? in the New Testament without anybody seeming to know about him in the Old Testament. So the Mormon just kind of, Mormon religion just kind of retcons that and puts Jesus from the beginning. Adam and Eve were the first Christians. And uh, so I find that all fascinating and it was really fun to illustrate that in Lego. I have my Lego Jesus meeting Moses on the mountain and, uh, and uh, meeting Adam and Eve in the garden and all that. So thanks for the question, that was a good one. Evan, did you want to add yeah. something there? Oh. Can I ask something? Oh, go ahead. Aren't the Father and the Son, two separate gods, though, in Mormonism? Yes. There is the Heavenly yeah. Father, who is, the, who is the Father, and then there's Jesus Christ. But, uh, but Jesus Christ usurps the role of Yahweh, and, he and Heavenly Father in the Old Testament is uh, really only seen at the very beginning in creation. And then it's kind of a Heavenly Father who's so elevated that he doesn't really interact directly he with, just the, naps with the world. That. Yeah, yeah it just kind of sits, okay. sits back and, he did and what he wanted. Jesus right. does the, the work. And Yah yes, Yahweh is, is, is uh, Jesus' spiritual name. I was going to add, actually, a lot of, in my experience of reading through the Bible, a lot of Christians believe that Jesus uh, not necessarily was Yahweh, but they would, uh, these commentaries that I would read as I was going through it would say, oh, this, this angel that he met with, that was Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, well, then why didn't he just say, I, hey, I'm Jesus, you'll see me later a few thousand years, whatever. That would have cleared a lot up. Like, uh, anyway. It's funny that he, they waited until all the other pagan religions around them had demigods for sons. It's like, oh, yeah, we got one, too. We yeah. got one, too. Um, I just want to jump in real fast because I also wrote a book on the Mormons uh, in the religion series. And the thing that surprised me the most about them was that it wasn't just Joseph Smith who was a total bastard. It wasn't just Brigham Young who was a total bastard. There's this whole rogues gallery in early Mormonism and the things that got away, they got away with back then, it would make such an awesome HBO series. Just, you know, the first 10 years of Mormonism alone, it, mwah, sex, violence, you name it, they've got it. It'd be awesome. All right, do we have another question? Other? What about Revelations? What is Revelations? It is a book. It's, it's a book in the way that psychotropic drugs are something you take to have a good day. Um, the book of Revelations, it's fascinating. Um, Christians go so crazy with it, but historians, when you actually look at the book of, of Revelations, they can crack some of the code on there, and some of the wiggier, gnarlier parts of it actually make a kind of sense if, you're, if you can crack the code. For instance, the number of the beast, 666, or 616, depending which text you're reading, um, all refer to Nero. They're, and we've been able to like, track the timeline that this book was written because it's talking about the reign of Nero and Christians being persecuted there. And like the kingdom, the king, the, the beast with all these crowns is like the Roman Empire, and this is the, the, the kings and such. Um, and you can just go down through the numbers and, and um, it kind of takes the fun out of it from a um, rapture sort of way, because Christians have built up this whole mythology on how this is all supposed to be about the end times and all these freaky things that are going to happen. And really, they were thinking, you know, when most of the people who wrote the books in the New Testament wrote, they thought it they was about the end of the world too, and they thought it was going to happen any minute now, any second now in their lifetimes in the first century. I got a couple favorite things about Revelation. First is, 
uh, in the very beginning, somewhere near the beginning, if I remember right, uh, two stars, I believe, fall into Earth, and then more things happen on Earth <laughs> after that. So that, that's a little unclear science there. Uh, and then my other favorite thing is during the course, and this happens a lot in the Bible, uh, there, there are people, supposedly, in Revelation, who are seeing this happen. They saw the star fall on the Earth. I don't know, it must be that big or something. <laughs> And they also saw, I mean, there's lakes of fire, there's these weird lizard monsters, there's just crazy stuff's happening, and they still don't believe. Like, I, if I were, the, if that starts happening, I'll be like, oh, I was wrong, I was wrong, sorry, sorry, I was wrong about, it. you're right, so, okay, I'm a Christian, you, you were right, if that all starts happening, I'm in, I mean, okay, fine, I, I'll be very confused, but, I, but in the book, these people are still like, no, nah, I'm not, definitely not all that happening out there. I'm still a firm atheist. And then they get killed after that. That's exactly like in the New Testament, or in the uh, Gospels, when Jesus does a miracle and feeds the fire. Yeah, and yeah. they can't believe it. And then two verses later, he does the exact same thing, and they still can't believe it. What are we going to do, Jesus? It's the exact same story. Yeah. But wait, David, David Smalley, <laughs> how was that? He did a competition where they were decorating the, or somebody illustrated the beast of the revelations, and you like did a like a competition to see who was the best. Did you guys ever get a winner? It's online. You got to go to, is it on like dogmadebate.com or something? And he had an illustration competition of it's like Trump, the, right? Trump is the Antichrist? <laughs> yeah. And that's the irony is the only people who believed in the Antichrist are the ones who voted him into office. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like we got more. We have other questions in the audience. My question has to do with, uh, uh, I talk to people sometimes about, you know, my, my atheistic beliefs or my lack of belief in a god or, or supernatural stuff. And one of the, the most common uh, problems I come up with discussing it with people and uh, is compartmentalization, where folks are perfectly willing to uh, uh, apply reason to things like uh, medical care, getting their car to run right, flying in an airplane, all kinds of things in their life, reason and logic are very uh, important to them and they're, they're down with it. And as soon as it uh, shifts the conversation to religious belief and, and does it make sense that the Bible says X, Y, and Z, does it make sense that uh, you know, dozens of religions around the world all claim to be the one true religion, all the inconsistencies, when you try to talk about that with the same person, there's a brick wall and compartmentalization where they, they're, they're perfectly willing to shut off reason, shut off uh, thinking, you know, logic, and just reply with, because I just know it's true, or I, I feel this way, and I just know it's true. I just know it's true is really the three words I get the most, that there's no way to reason with that. Any, any response? The, one, the first thought that comes to mind is when somebody goes, to, when they've gone that far against the wall, you can say, so what's the difference between you and a Muslim, you and a Mormon, you know, uh, all those guys who are going to hell? Well, I could say something. You can go ahead. I, pause. I mean, I think you, you kind of already hit the nail on the head where it is such an emotional connection. Um, you know, if, it's, if someone talks to God every day and God does minor, minor miracles for that person every, all the time. Um, and sometimes there, there's a, a conversion story that's so emotional, then yeah, you just know, I think. So I think some people have to uh, think that some things just don't add up. And maybe, maybe you can loosen that grip a little bit. But um, yeah, but yeah, that's definitely a spectrum, I think. I was just going to add, I, I disagree a little bit, though, with the premise of your question, which is that uh, people aren't very logical about their medical care. Um, there's, there's a lot, an awful lot. I, I, I noted a, a situation I was in a few years ago back when, uh, at my old job. Uh, somebody, I had a headache or something, I can't remember, and, and somebody uh, offered me uh, some, some bullshit uh, thing. Some like, oh, here's this echivitaminacea, seaweed, whatever, something. And I, I don't want to take something that I don't know what it is. So I was like, oh, okay, I was trying to resist it. And I looked it up, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is total BS. It's just nothing. And then, I, and then the feeling I had right after that was, what do I say to this person? Like, how do, do, I, do I have to pretend I took it and I, I'm okay with it? Do I have to pretend 
that it worked? Do I, and I realized, like, wait, why, why am I the one who feels guilty in this situation? Why am I the one who feels guilty for looking something up and just doing basic research? And now I feel bad about having to dispel this little myth that someone has. And it's weird. I don't know. I, I think that, you know, that happens every day times a million. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you say that because I was thinking the exact same thing as he was talking because, again, you know, I was saying I grew up, a, I mean, my stuff was biblical, literalist, you know, faith healing, that sort of thing. And I'm like, no, no, there was plenty of times when I thought I was dying and, like, I chose to stay home and suffer through it uh, instead of going to the doctor. Or, no, there was plenty of times that I put my money in the church instead of paying a bill you know, and then the lights got cut off, and then I'm down at DSS, like, I need somebody to pay my light bill for me. Like, no, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm listening to the same sort of thing. And then that's also funny, because I've been in that same predicament before of, like, oh, you should drink some, like, alkaline water, or, like, <laughs> take this homeopathy. And I'm like, <laughs> it feels like, so horrible to, to just have do to what tell you, them. it should be a favor. Oh, I looked up this nonsense. It's nonsense. They should be like, thank you. Oh, wow. I was, <laughs> wow, I was doing nonsense. I'm so glad yeah. that you corrected me. But just no. Just like last week, like just last week, somebody was trying to tell me I needed to drink some alkaline water for something. And I was like, yeah, I've heard of that before. Uh-huh. It's okay. I think I'm okay. No, I'm right? better. I'm, I'm better. I'm just thinking about it. I'm better now. <laughs> Whatever it was. Yeah, they were telling me my pH was off and I needed to drink some alkaline water. I was like, okay. But when an adult believes in Santa, yeah. then... For the deist on the panel, maybe? <laughs> I hate to tell you, but Santa Claus didn't exist either. St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas did not exist either. <laughs> All right. Oh, Can I? Oh, hello. If I could ask a question now. Um, so this weekend, wow, this is a powerful mic. <laughs> uh, this weekend uh, in Washington, there's a group meeting. I guess it's the American Family I uh, just turned, uh, okay. So there's a group meeting in, I think it's in Washington, Ma American Family Council. Um, so if you want entertainment, um, <laughs> it'll be all over YouTube. And uh, I would hope that some of you would uh, chime in in the comment section. Where you can comment is uh, people for the American Way have a YouTube channel called Right Wing Watch. And it's one of my favorite things to watch, although it can be quite scary. But it's also very entertaining. And I'm wondering um, how you keep yourselves informed about what the right wing is doing and give us some resources. I, I am going to advise people to, to watch that one. Well, Right Wing Watch is an awesome organization. They really are brilliant. Um, for different, I mean, there's so many types of bullshit out there that there is very specialized um, watchdog groups for like Mormonism, um, for like you know Jehovah's Witnesses, for fill in the blank um, down the line. There's uh, we're living in the age of the internet where everything out there has its counterpart on the internet somewhere, which is awesome. Um, it's it, one of the reasons that, at, at least at the college level, uh, the current generation is getting less and less and less religious. It's the lowest levels of religiosity in human history since they've been keeping track of the polls. So sooner, yeah, yeah, that's worth clapping about. Because right now it sucks, it's really bad right now, but on the long front, we're coming out on top because every day Fox News loses another viewer to senility or the grave, and we get three atheist activists in college, you know, coming out. Every day that's happening. I um I just listen to everything, I read everything, I watch everything. Like I don't I mean everything, right? I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but I intentionally get outside of the bubble. Like you know how we all get text alerts and stuff like okay, I get my CNN text alerts, but I also get Fox text alerts, you know, or you know, I listen to NPR all day and 
periodically you might get in my car and Rush Limbaugh might come on. I mean, I listen to every, I know, but he just asked how, that's how I know. That's how I know what's going on because I like actually listen to them. So yeah, like I'm, I am on their websites and I read it and I grin and bear it. And I mean, seriously though, like, yeah, I, am I disgusted sometimes? Yeah, but the question is, how do you know? You don't know what's going on in the enemy camp if you don't look and listen and peek and every once in a while. Absolutely, I think we also face a, a big challenge because uh, the, the president's Twitter account is such a circus that it overtakes He'll tweet like, what, did he just insult the penis size of another lead? Like, you never know. You would believe anything that, he, that somebody said he tweeted because he'll tweet anything. Yeah. And that uh, causes a problem because there's, there's more harm going on that we're not noticing because he's so out there. Uh, meanwhile, Jeff Sessions is, is you know, rolling back the, the war on drugs and is, is doing all this stuff. Like, real harm is happening. So I think it is important to keep an eye on that and not just be distracted by the, the Trump tweet of the day, which... I think oftentimes he is using to distract from other things that are going on. Yeah, yeah. Do we have it? We're running a little short. Uh, we, okay, maybe, yeah. One more question. This has to do with climate change. Christians have denied climate change. Some, there are some good Christians out there. Yes, there are. And they're not all bad. But some Christians have decided that if God wanted to destroy this earth, he already have done it. And because he made this earth, he doesn't want to destroy this earth. So climate change really is something made up. So that that's, that's what we heard. And Donald Trump said that on Twitter too, right. by the way. He says a lot of things, yeah. One, th one thing I want to point out is behind the scenes, there is not a single Republican senator, congressman, representative who does not believe in ch climate change. They all know it's real. They all know who caused it. They also know they will lose their job. Nothing will make them lose their jobs faster than saying so in public. But on a governmental level, behind the scenes, they all know that. They all know it. Even the snowball guy? Even the snowball guy. No, I don't. <laughs> Isn't he gone? Yeah. Is he gone? Except for the, the fundamentalist Christians who are in there. But all, the, all the, the ones who are purely Republicans, purely Democrats, they know. They know. They're already making plans because the government knows in, by 2050, these, according to the government sources uh, or government reports, half of all the airports in America are going to be underwater. The military knows it, the government knows it, they're taking steps to, to do something about it now. Yeah. And, uh, and also, oil companies know. And oil <laughs> they companies have known know for it. quite yeah. some time. Yeah. Even uh, Rex Tillerson knew yeah. until he started needing to say things to make certain people right. happy. It's, right. it's really distressing. It's, and it's disgusting. It's disgusting how cynical they are and how they're, they know what they're saying is not true. They know what they're saying is hurting the country and yet they want to stay in power. So they're, this is why we have gerrymandering. This is why we have you know, any number of sins on that side of the fence. Yeah. How are we doing? Time done? All done? Okay, Thank you, that's folks. All the time Thanks, we have. everybody. Thank you so much to our panel. Uh, thank you so much to the questions that we got. Uh, you guys were great. Thanks.